Today and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third North America industry update from Tourism Australia. Uh, we thank you guys for uh, joining us today and uh, happy to see uh, so many of you uh, joining our update today. Uh, my name is Chris Allison, uh, Head of Commercial Partnerships at Tourism Australia. I'm going to be acting as your host for today's update. Um, before we start, I'm just going to run through a bit of housekeeping and then talk to you guys about the agenda and lineup of speakers that we have today. Um, if we could flip to the next slide, Rod, that would be awesome. Um, so in terms of the agenda, so we've got a really um, fantastic uh, session and theme lined up today. So uh, to kick things off, as always, we'll hear from uh, our VP, Jane Whitehead. We'll talk to you uh, a little bit about um, uh, latest um, activity uh, that we're up to in the North American markets. Um, then we're going to welcome Andrew Hogg. Andrew Hogg is our uh, Executive General Manager for our Eastern Markets. Uh, and at the moment is also heading up uh, Tourism Australia's focus on our aviation recovery strategy. And he's going to be talking to us about some of the work that we are doing uh, in collaboration with all of our other partners in Australia around how we can support um, aviation return uh, as and when uh, timeframes allow. Uh, then we're really excited to welcome uh, as well today Stephen Thompson from Qantas. Stephen will be familiar to most of you. He heads up the Qantas team here in uh, the Americas region. Uh, and Stephen will be talking to Andrew about some of the things that Qantas are focused on and giving some of his perspectives around Qantas's work and um, how they're focused on uh, kind of returning their business um, the moment with, with a particular focus on uh, domestic Australia. Uh, and then to round things up, um, we're also going to be joined by uh, Rob Dugan. So Rob joined us, uh, for those of you that joined our first uh, webinar a few weeks ago, uh, Rob's going to join us and provide uh, a bit more further update in terms of some of the latest research that Tourism Australia is undertaking with a specific deep dive into some of the insights that we are seeing and measuring from both the US and Canada. So we, uh, we do hope that you guys will uh, find that uh, useful uh, to you today. Um, as if you guys do want to ask us any questions uh, during the course of the session today, we'll uh, look to answer those either during the updates or at the end. You can ask the questions uh, using the Q&A panel at the bottom um, of your uh, of your Zoom screen, so please type those in as they come along, and we'll uh, endeavour to, to answer those as we go through. Um, so, without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Jane, uh, who's going to uh, talk to us about um, latest updates from uh, from the team here in North America. So, hi, Jane. Thanks, Chris, and hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us again. Um, I'd just like to provide a, a brief update um, today on our continuing activities. After pausing media uh, out of respect for the recent protests over the past couple of weeks, we have this week resumed our Inspire Consumer Social uh, and Content Marketing, as we outlined the plan a couple of webinars ago. Um, so this includes content on Travel and Leisure's digital and social channels in partnership with our state and territory organisations. Um, amplification of inspirational content in the US and also promotion of on-demand live from Oz content in Canada. We also have a proactive PR program to pitch uh, inspirational and virtual content. And as Australia reopens for domestic tourism, we're also looking at opportunities to work with media in Australia uh, that also contribute to North American media outlets to provide new content. I also wanted to give a, a, an update on the great interest that we've been seeing in our Aussie Specialist Program and the virtual program the team has been running to promote registration, qualification and engagement. Nearly 1,000 advisors have registered for the program since lockdown began in March, which is, um, which is a terrific um, demonstration of, of the interest and in, in how many advisors are using this time to upskill. More than 400 of these have also moved through the program and qualified to become an Aussie specialist, which is a large increase on what we would normally see over a similar time frame. So now we have 2,300 uh, qualified Aussie specialists in uh, the US and 840 in Canada. Um, a trade media campaign promoting uh, lo with Love From Oz content has been really well received as well. And we've seen a really strong 27% open rate on a recent EDM series. Um, and our Wednesday walkabout webinar series, um, which has increased to a weekly format, um, has had a 30% increase in attendance. 
So we are going to continue to look at ways to help inspire and educate both our consumer and industry audiences while international travel restrictions remain in place. And we know many of you also have really great initiatives um, to stay connected with uh, your consumers and, and clients and, and business partners as well. So a, a big thank you to all you are doing in that respect. In addition, we have plans in place um, or plans in development to support the restart of North American tourism when restrictions are lifted. Unfortunately, we don't have any update today on uh, the timing of that or when key decisions will be made. But of course, an absolutely critical uh, factor in the recovery will be the restoration of uh, international air capacity. From a Tourism Australia perspective, we really want to do all we can to support this. Um, we have been staying in touch touch with all of our airline partners um, and are, are really pleased to be hearing from our North American um, uh, aviation partners that they re remain very committed to the Australian market um, when travel is again permitted. Um, as Chris mentioned, we're really pleased to be joined um, on today's webinar by two special guests. So Andrew, um, as our Execu Executive General Manager for Eastern Markets and Aviation, um, now has an expanded role. Um, with a long career in, uh, in, in aviation with 20 years at Qantas and most recently uh, five years spearheading Tourism Australia's um, work with partners to support uh, the increase in China air capacity as the regional general manager for China. Um, Andrew is um, heading up our aviation recovery strategy in partnership with state and territory organisations and airports. Um, so he will talk a little bit about what we're doing there. And of course, many of you know Stephen, um, and Stephen is um, Senior Executive uh, General Manager for the Americas, New Zealand, Pacific Islands, and Japan, um, is a, an absolutely key partner. Qantas is, is a, a really valued partner, of course, to us here, and absolutely critical uh, to the recovery of Australian tourism. Um, so delighted to hear, if some of you may have heard from uh, on, on Pip's webinar with Alan, uh, the excellent update talking about the work that Qantas is doing to support the domestic recovery, um, but also re reiterating how important this market is to Qantas, um, which is really great. So we're delighted to um, have Stephen join us to uh, give an update from the North American perspective. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to you, Andrew. G'day, Jane. Thanks very much. And um, we'll Good evening to everybody. So it's great to um, to be here and, and really do thank you for your time today. Um, aviation is obviously one of the key drivers and one of the most important facets of, of ensuring that um, you know, the visitors that do come to Australia arrive um, you know, safely and arrive well into Australia. And unfortunately with the borders closed, we've seen a significant reduction in airline capacity and seats into Australia in line with what we've seen from obviously not just uh, uh, into Australia, but this is also a global trend as well. And we've seen this in, in many of the markets that, uh, you know, global, whether it be from a domestic perspective with reduced capacity around the globe, um, within countries, within borders, but also, um, you know, obviously externally as well. Australia is now um, very much focused on the domestic market uh, whilst the border remains closed and whilst we continue to, to uh, the battle against COVID. So, um, you know, domestic tourism has been what we have seen uh, in, in Australia now is starting to come back online again and we're seeing some capacity and some some early indicators as to that rising capacity as well. I'll just um, just wanted to go through this morning just a couple of things what Tourism Australia has actually uh, been working with our with our partners and how important those partners are and part of our aviation recovery strategy as well but obviously it's a very broad consultative process that we're going through and as, uh, as Jane mentioned um, you know we have to continue to engage and ensure that we engage with our partners globally. So it's not just about um, you know, dealing with uh, what we're doing in Australia, but also continue to engage right across the board on all of our international partners that we've had. But importantly to that too, our external consultations are just as important. So working very, very closely with the major airports in Australia, and there's a, a full list of all the airports that we've been working very closely with. And uh, the, the, the three key gateways um, into Australia from the US being uh, Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne are obviously very important to us as well. But we established a working group uh, with Tourism Australia's executive leadership team, um, the importance of working with Jane and the VPs uh, globally about you know, the local contacts and the local insights that each of those markets have through to um, the 
the uh, Minister for Tourism or Trade, Tourism and Investment in Australia, the Federal Minister, working very closely with the Department of Infrastructure and Transport and Regional Development, uh, as the Australian Trade, so Austrade with DFAT and obviously with Home Affairs as well with regard to those border openings. So working very closely. And our airline consultations have for the US have certainly been very, very strong as well. So working very closely with the Qantas Group, uh, with American United, Delta, uh, Air Canada, uh, Virgin Australia, and obviously in New Zealand as well with the connectivity points that they have. But also again, working with uh, the airports, making sure that we do connect, but also ensuring that we're well connected with IATA, um, the, and on their regional air transport industry restart summits, and also working with some of the key, what we'd say, uh, very heavily dependent upon tourism uh, parts in Australia. For example, uh, Voyages uh, Indigenous uh, uh, Tourism at um, uh, Ayers Rock. So Uluru is very, very important and making sure that they get uh, adequate capacity to be able to restart as well. So we're working very closely with a whole range of partners. And that is about prioritising and making sure that uh, Tourism Australia is very focused on what that aviation recovery is. What we don't want is when borders open to be um, obviously behind the eight ball on all of these things. And we want to make sure that you know, we continue to focus very clearly on uh, what Tourism Australia can do to try and influence and increase capacity and frequency across the board. And that is obviously on some of the things that we've been working off from uh, in the past, as well as driving that demand and demonstrating to our partners that uh, you know, we're very much focused on uh, delivering some outcomes so that they have confidence, the airlines have confidence to add more capacity and increase the frequency as well across most of our routes. I'll just go into the next slide there. So how we've been doing that is obviously we're leading and coordinating amongst all the stakeholders and airlines. Um, and we're looking at how we do that with regard to um, packaging up offers to airlines to uh, restart. And we understand and we know how difficult it is for our aviation partners, particularly for the airlines and the airports who have seen their businesses you know, grind to a complete halt in some cases and very limited cases. Working with the Australian airports to ensure that they've got you know, the, the appropriate aeronautical discounts and incentives. Um, how then obviously you know, they also work on the outbound marketing where Tourism Australia doesn't do that. Working with our state and territory partners as well is just as important. Um, and that's on the route marketing and the support and the contributions and asking our states to take the lead with the regional tourism organisations. We know that 83% uh, of air freight into and out of Australia, or particularly out of Australia and out of, into Australia, um, is on carried on passenger aircraft. Actually, 83% of that is carried on passenger aircraft. So working very closely with our trade partners uh, through Austrade um, to ensure that uh, you know we're well across what they're doing in the freight assistance program, and also working with Department of Infrastructure Transport um, in Australia around the air services agreements and the bilateral relations. So I just want to make sure that we, you know, we do cover off all of these areas here. And, and the other part too is obviously working very closely with the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and that's on the people to people and the diplomacy that's around that as well. And Home Affairs, uh, which is uh, looks after immigration visas, so that we've got uh, great visitor visa arrangements and the processing uh, can continue as well as looking at some markets um, where we don't have the um, the speed and ease of being able to obtain a visa to Australia that we're well focused on being able to get them to deliver on many of the uh, uh, the aspects of the del uh, visa delivery process as well to speed that up too. Just on the next slide there. This slide really doesn't need me to be talking too much around. It shows that the um, you know, we've been tracking the crisis originally when uh, the COVID started in China and uh, Australia and, uh, you know, uh, paused all activity between Australia and China in terms of visitation. We saw a decline and then as COVID changed to a uh, global, uh, we saw that the obviously the, the uh, enormous decline in aviation capacity. And as I said, Australia is not alone in this. This is a global uh, slowdown and a global uh, realignment of the capacity with many aircraft being parked around the world and also making sure that uh, you know that they could uh, secure their um, their balance sheets by not uh, operating aircraft that would be empty and again with border closures in many many countries including Australia um, that really then took uh, much of our capacity away during that particular time as well as you can see the change year on year we're tracking that change to see when it's starting to come back and you can see some early shoots there of capacity starting to 
come back. And that's in advance of the border reopening. Um, we don't have any time frame for that at this stage. Some of that capacity has been coming back because of the freight issue um, and ensuring that freight can be carried, but also internationally, Australians returning. So the uh, although there's a little bit of capacity coming back in uh, to the market from, from July, it's really around Australians that have been returning and, and international air freight that's been operated on passenger aircraft as well. So we would expect this will continue until such stage that you know, we get some indicators as to, to borders reopening as well. Uh, I'll just jump onto the next one there. So what we had to do was look at distilling our international aviation recovery and what that opportunity would look like. And we identified that the you know, 300 plus international air routes into Australia, um, obviously from the US, a very, very important market for Australia and one in which we've uh, invested in heavily and making sure that we have the right partners, but globally as well, with middle, many of the, uh, the, the midpoint carriers being you know, Cathay Pacific, uh, the Middle Eastern carriers, but also some of the European carriers coming into Australia, as well as the uh, uh, Singapore and uh, out of China as well as many of the airlines flying in there. The 245 air routes into Australia that were um, from a priority source markets where Tourism Australia has its footprint. So you know, Tourism Australia has offices in Asia, um, in North Asia, in China, in Japan, in Singapore, India, uh, Indonesia, uh, obviously the US and, and Canada. Um, we went through and Europe, uh, UK and Europe as well. So we looked at all of those routes, there were 245 of those that are of significant importance to us. And then 100 plus air routes into Australia of significant inbound importance. We had to distill this down because as we know, we can't do everything. And we know that um, you know, at that point in time, you know, when the recovery starts, we've got to move very quickly on these, on many of those routes. Um, there are 60 air routes into Australia that are critical for tourism recovery, particularly the US and the, uh, the Trans-Pacific is very, very important to uh, uh, tourism recovery and also being able to work with those with the international airlines on what that would look. So our aspirational goals for, for the Team Australia approach would be that 50 plus international inbound air routes established by December uh, 21, 90% uh, of air frequencies recovered uh, would be a, would be obviously a, a great goal to have and a very aspirational goal. And obviously having some uh, competitive uh, flights on some of these as well with more than one airline flying on one route. And, uh, you know, of course, we want to see Australia serviced well before and get ahead of the recovery points of many of our, our key competitors globally. Uh, thank you for your time. And I just also wanted to uh, to say uh, a big welcome to Stephen Thompson, uh, the uh, Executive Vice President of the Americas for uh, Japan and New Zealand. Um, g'day, Stephen. How are you? Andrew, very well, thank you. And yourself? Very well. Very good. Great to see you. And um, Likewise. We won't be confused as, um, as brothers, although we do have very similar hairstyles. Yes, yes. So, uh, Stephen... Um, some great announcements from Qantas in the domestic market uh, in the last couple of weeks, which has been fantastic. And, and that's been around um, safe flying and fly well, fly safe in Australia and giving consumers confidence domestically. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and, and what's been going on there? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks, Andrew. Um, well, look, firstly, hello to everyone uh, in the US. I'm, uh, I'm in Sydney at the moment. I came down here for a couple of weeks leave in March and I'm still here. I know Andrew was uh, similar. He came down in January for a week's leave and is, is still in Sydney. So uh, looking forward to uh, to getting back to uh, the US as quickly as I can. Um, but look, there has been a, uh, a lot that we've been going through down here in Australia. Uh, and unfortunately, it's been primarily focused on the uh, on the domestic market. Primarily because of the uh, the closures of the uh, of the borders, etc. But uh, I think um, what we've been trying to do is basically, um, as Andrew said, the Fly Well program that we've launched is about trying to restore confidence in consumers for flying. I think that has been one of the biggest challenges that any airline around the world has been facing with is the perception of uh, of flying again. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that do want to fly, but there's that whole feeling about that there is an expectation that it will be done differently. So, you know, we've put a, a lot of focus uh, on that. Um, in reality, we've put the airline into hibernation 
Um, like Andrew said, I've got aircraft parked around the world um, and uh, and here in Australia. But I think at um, on the domestic scene, we were down to about 5% of our capacity that we previously operated. Um, we're sort of starting to ease that back. And as part of where sort of announcing uh, additional flying in the Australian domestic market, it's very much around, uh, you know, this fly, fly well, which is around trying to restore confidence uh, for consumers. So um, what we're doing there is very much around, uh, around the check-in, the pre-flight experience. Um, it's that contactless check-in. So it's trying to minimise the amount of face-to-face uh, -face interaction with people. Um, we're getting people to uh, check in on, online or on apps. Um, there's enhanced cleaning around terminals. There's hand sanitizers being placed uh, right throughout. Um, we've got physical distancing taking place. Um, the lounges, as we start to open those up, um, will be completely different from a, a food and beverage style. Um, a lot more gone will be the buffets um, and the food offering will be different. So we're doing those sorts of things. And, and then, of course, um, uh, the when you get on board the aircraft, um, we're also uh, sort of uh, prioritising boarding. There's more um, sort of uh, process to make sure people are more spread out. And in, in the US, the, the market there is used to a scramble. As soon as the, the flight's boarding, you've got about 150 people struggling to get through to get in so they can get their bags in an overhead, um, uh, the overhead locker. But we're sort of controlling that a lot more down here in Australia. Um, we're, we're giving people uh, a, a flow wheel kit um, as they're getting on board, and that involves uh, a face mask, giving everyone a face mask, uh, hand sanitizers so that people do want to wipe down seat belts or, or tray tables, etc. They can also do that. Um, we're also obviously doing deep cleaning of aircraft, there's a lot more intensive cleaning of aircraft, but I think the, the real important one here is around the the ventilation system, the air conditioning units that are on board aircraft, Andrew, and that is that you know ninety nine point nine percent of all particles are removed every three to five minutes um, on board an aircraft, and it, it's just trying to communicate to people that you know in reality there's been no um, transmission of the virus uh, on board aircraft anywhere in the world, um, but it, it's just trying to get that comfort factor back into consumers. So that's what a lot of our education is, uh, has been down here in the Australian market. Yeah, I think that consumer confidence piece has been one that, that people have have really sort of focused on at the moment. And um, some of those important points that around the aircraft cleanliness, um, particularly around face masks, sanitization, deep cleaning of the aircraft are important. But one of the big ones is, is how many times that the air inside the aircraft, people assume that inside an aircraft that the, the air doesn't change, but it changes every couple of minutes and goes through yeah. those um, medical grade HEPA filters. So it's removing, you know, 99.9% .9 of the of bacteria and, and um, you know, things out of the air. So uh, um, I can assure you, Stephen, that once we're uh, up and running here in Australia, I'm very happy to jump on a Qantas plane and uh, and go on a on a short break. Yeah, I, I think everyone's uh, is is itching to get back in the air. I, I think the other thing, and it's slightly different to the US, because the US, uh, I know in the last um, day or so, are basically mandating people wearing face masks, and and I, and I think it's. The Australian market is so different to the US market just around where the virus is up to. So it, it is so much more contained in Australia. Um, so we're recommending people wear masks. We're not mandating it, um, only on the basis that it, it is around that comfort for, for customers. Um, but when you actually have a look at the way aircraft are designed, the seats, you've got high, high seats uh, in front of you. Um, you've, you've got that, that distancing. And, and so we won't be um, having the, the middle seat uh, blocked out or anything like that because all the advice from IATA, all the medical, the chief medical officer, uh, we, we don't think it, it's necessary. Um, but as I say, the, the situation with the virus in Australia is so different to what's happening in other parts of the world. So whilst you'll see it mandated in some countries, it won't be mandated in Australia. It's more around comfort. 
Yeah, and I think that's important that, that you know each country is doing their own thing. And one of the things that IATA had had were looking for was some consistency globally around how this is dealt with and, and what we do. And we're still some time away from from doing that. Yep. I think that that confidence piece is can't be understated for the consumer level to say, you know, I can jump on a plane and, and fly down. And you know, Qantas has been at the forefront of long haul aviation for what is celebrating your 100th year and yeah. congratulations. Um, you know, it's, it's a fantastic milestone for Qantas. And unfortunately it is this year that it turns 100, but um, you know, Qantas has been through, uh, through adversity in, in the hundred years as we've seen with, with many of the things that have gone on globally in a hundred years. And um, being at the forefront of that long haul aviation, I think would, obviously Qantas will set a trend globally as it has done in the past with service. You know, Qantas was one of the first airlines to introduce business class. Um, do you see, do you see that there might be more, uh, you know, more, more things for, uh, from particularly a long haul perspective about people saying, you know, I might want to upgrade and um, fly more in, in, in business and first class. Uh, look, it's that's certainly likely to be. I think one of the um, one of the opportunities for that um, for premium classes as we go forward. I think um, our challenge right at the moment is that's still some way off um, in the, in the total scheme of things. I think the challenges that we've got when we look at the international part of the business is it's not around. Um, us not wanting to do things. There, there are issues just around, as I think you've already mentioned, around the borders. Um, you know, that's been one of the biggest challenges that we've got because not only has there been the, the Australian border being shut, um, with the exception of um, repatriation flights that, you know, we've been thrilled to be able to do, working with the Australian government, who I think have done a brilliant job in managing COVID, uh, is re repatriating Australia's back to Australia, um, bring them back home from around the world. So we've had multiple flights out of uh, Los Angeles, out of the UK and out of, uh, out of Asia, et cetera. So uh, I think it's, um, that, that's been almost the limit of our international flying over the last few months has been the re repatriation flights, but they've now come to, a, uh, come to an end. So uh, I think for us, Andrew, the international, um, we're in a situation that the Australian borders are still shut um, until I think the date at the moment is around 17 September. Um, so there's unlikely to be um, any real international flying up until that point. Um, we've even had the challenges domestically with borders being shut within Australia. So we're trying to uh, work with state governments as they start to lift and, and thankfully uh, it looks like a lot of the states will be moving in July to uh, lifting border restrictions. Um, so that means that we should be able to get our, our domestic capacity up to around 40% if we can get that happening uh, in July and probably hopefully double that by the end of the year um, regionally. But uh, on the international front, I think our, our long haul is probably going to be almost restricted to almost a bubble uh, with, uh, with the Tasman uh, at this point in time. I think that will be the first one. Um, New Zealand, again, has done a fantastic job in managing COVID. Uh, although they had, I think, two cases yesterday for the first time in about three weeks. Um, and again, both of those cases have been a lot of the cases in Australia are linked to inbound international travellers that are either returning back to New Zealand or, or to Australia. Um, but, you know, if you take that to one side, I think they've managed it extremely well. So we're working with the government. We're a part of the, the group that is looking at the bubble and uh, with a bit of luck, we'll uh, be able to start flying the Tasman. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later, um, but we're still waiting on a, on a date for that one. Yeah, good early shoots, particularly on on getting things restarted, and that's often the often the, the, the most difficult part. And then you know, hopefully, there's some momentum behind that, and further travel bubbles open up at, at particular times as well. And I note that um, uh, it's a heady new is um, trying to open up uh, Lakes Papiate, and uh, yeah, obviously there'll be some difficulties around that. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll see some some uh, early shoots on on what's going on and some early indicators as well. Um, tell us a little bit about. I think one of the one of the important areas is the uh, the great partnership that you've had with American Airlines as well. You know, can we expect that to continue into the future as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what this has sort of really highlighted as you work your way through. I think 
every airline around the world has said they're going to look different as they come out of uh, out of COVID. And the, the general consensus is there's a number of around 30% smaller. Um, you know, the US for us is absolutely critical. Um, it has been our, one of our primary drivers of success on the international um, um, outlook for, for him for years, almost since we've been flying across the Pacific, it's always been critical. And that won't change as it comes out, but partnerships will be absolutely critical. Um, we're in constant dialogue with America and they're, they've made a lot of changes. And, and, you know, when I talk around the size, I think American have already announced that they've had 39,000 people either voluntary redundancies or early retirement so far out of their employment base and they're, they're in the process of taking further 30% out of their management um, and um, their administration staff. So that's very consistent with what's happening around. So they're, they're going through a lot of changes the same as what we'll be going through um, and every airline around the world and, and we're still working through it ourselves. But all that shows is that as airlines start to shape up what they look like, it's going to be absolutely critical that you've got partners that you can work with around the world. And for us, American Airlines is still, has always been a critical partner for us. Um, we're, we're in dialogue with them constantly. Um, and yes, our partnership will be continuing. Um, we've got the uh, immunised joint business, which will uh, is going to be critical that we can align network, we can do things as we come out and we can add capacity as demand comes through as the, uh, as the borders open. And um, without that partnership, uh, it would have been even more challenging. And I think the other great one that sort of happened of late is also Alaska Airlines as well. Um, they've now got closer with, uh, with American, which is great um, because Alaska is also a great partner. So when you add American Airlines now with Alaska, um, it really gives us a great footprint for the US when we're in a position to uh, open up again. Yeah, the partnerships are obviously going to be vital for you going forward. But one of the other exciting things over the that's been discussed and some proving flights that initially had, had occurred was the uh, Project Sunrise. Um, yep. it, it may play a greater role in connectivity points, particularly from the east coast of the US to try and get you know, people who want to go on that zero stops direct in. Is Qantas still pursuing the, the Project Sunrise program at this stage? Yeah, look, we've, we've just sort of parked it just at the moment as we work through everything else. And, and, you know, for us, our priority is getting the domestic market up and going and then starting the, the international. Um, Project Sunrise is still critical. I, I totally agree with you. I think that ultra long haul flying will be even more important as we go forward. I think it's going to be a position um, for airlines around the world as they just return to profitability over the next few years and then and start to uh, reinvest in that sort of technology and, and that um, and those processes. But, you know, Project Sunrise <coughs> captured the imagination of the world, to be totally honest, that, that ultra-long haul flying from New York to Sydney non-stop between London and, and Sydney, etc. cetera, um, absolutely got global exposure. And um, people were worried about that length of time on board an aircraft, but uh, I think you know as we move forward, the um, that sort of connectivity, just straight that ultra long haul flying, I think will become more important. So I think Project Sunrise will be absolutely critical for us as we uh, as we move forward. But that'll be at the appropriate time, though. Yeah, and I think that's something that that you know, where a customer might be looking at saying, oh. You know, I might be more concerned about flying if it's, um, you know, on an airline that has a great reputation for safety, um, not only in the air, but also inside the cabin, if you, you know, with, with the yeah. new world that we're having to go with. I think that's something that people will, will look towards. I know that Tourism Australia has been doing some work around consumer sentiment, but obviously at this stage, it's still very early, um, considering the borders are still closed and we're all sort of coming to grips with what that new reality or what the new the new normal will look like and particularly some of the airlines around the world are uh, very focused on that short haul where you know if you're an intra-european airline it's easy to to go back and forth uh, you know across europe uh, in short time frames as well and Qantas has a uh, has had a, a great reputation for that that long haul um, you know aircraft that that you've got parked at the moment do you see things like different fleets that that might be more viable into the future as well uh, look uh, oh. We've, we've got A380s, our 789s, we've got A330s. I think 
um, we'll, we'll need to make sure we've got the right aircraft operating for the right demand. I mean, your graph that you showed earlier, Andrew, where you said that you could start to see some increases in, in flying. Uh, I think the big call out on that slide was that that was the number of seats available. It doesn't yeah. mean to say how many seat people are on board the aircraft, because I know that uh, a lot of the, air, the operators um, operating into Australia at the moment have got carrying, you know, seven, eight, nines with um, basically 14, 15, 20 customers on board. So, you know, I was speaking to the CEO of Lower Airport at, at LAX last week, or the week before, um, and they're back to about 30% capacity of seats from where they were, um, from about 10% in the middle of it. But, you know, again, his call out was that's the number of seats. It doesn't mean to say that's how many customers were uh, are actually travelling. So I think that's one of the, the biggest things is just how you start to grow that market again. And, you know, as you said, safety's always been our DNA. That's the heart of what we do. Um, and if anything, we're ultra cautious. Um, and we're not going to be doing things that will put our customers or our staff uh, at risk and we'll continue to uh, always make sure that we work with uh, all the, the right authorities as we, uh, as we come out of this. Yeah. Um, Stephen, um, you mentioned a little bit around the, uh, the repatriation of Australians back in, which has been just as important, but also um, yeah, uh, Qantas has also been... Uh, over the last couple of weeks, also been taking American citizens home as well, which has been fantastic. I think one of the great standouts for uh, for Qantas has been the contribution to community and the great work that that Qantas does, supporting not only the Australian government, Tourism Australia, its partners, but also you know the people of Australia as well as international, you know, in some of those rescue flights. So um, well done to to Qantas in in working very closely with the Australian government on those repatriation flights because we understand how important that is. Um, you know, in the hundredth year. Um, not a it's great not way. how we thought it would go, mate. I can no, assure you. not a great way. Not a great way to celebrate, but you know, we certainly wanted to uh, to recognise that this is uh, you know, Qantas is the oldest continually operating airline in the world, um, and Qantas has been a, a great partner of Tourism Australia, not only in the US but globally as well. We have a common goal and a common logo, the kangaroo. So. Um, Stephen, thank you very much for your time this morning and thanks very much for, for coming online. It's great to see you and, and keep well. Um, I'm sure you're itching to get back to uh, to the US to re-engage and to continue to engage, I should say, with, with our great uh, distribution partners uh, online. And I'll uh, hand back to Chris as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. That's great. Andrew, thank you so much. And, and Stephen, thanks again for joining us. I know it's a bit earlier in the day for, uh, for you guys down in, uh, in Sydney, so we really appreciate it. Um, Stephen's going to stick around to the end, just in case we have any some more, uh, more questions come up, so we'll, uh, we'll come back to that at the end. Um, so great, a great focused discussion there on uh, aviation, and I guess some of the things that we've been talking about there were just around you know, uh, border restrictions and, uh, more importantly, um, you know, customers' uh, appetite and sentiment to travel. Um, which is a great segue into introducing uh, back to the webinar series Rob Dugan, who's our Executive General Manager of Strategy and Insights. So good morning, Rob. Uh, Rob, Rob did join us uh, this, uh, when we did our first one uh, about three or four weeks ago, and uh, we've had some really fantastic updates in our research and insights, particularly as it relates to the North American market. So we wanted to bring back Rob and, and share some of those insights uh, with you today. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Rob. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, so if you just flick through to the next slide, um, so if, um, if you caught my first presentation, what I was really talking about was uh, something that we've set up called the Greenlight uh, Project, which, in, which includes some international kind of tracking uh, across 16 markets. I think the Greenlight Project initially was to understand when we could go back into markets and, and reinvest in kind of markets. And obviously, we were looking at lots of kind of lead indicators, including the sentiment tracker, which I'll take you through some of in a minute. In, in a minute. Um, but also, I think what we're realising is that really it comes down to kind of borders and borders being open. So we will keep tracking sentiment as we go along, um, but obviously we're keeping a very close eye on when these bubbles are emerging and when we think markets are coming back online from a border point of view. But in terms of the research, which I'll take you through, obviously 16 markets, uh, we were looking at this kind of data fortnight so we started tracking on the 23rd of April and the last dip was on the 10th of June. Um, we're looking at nationally representative 
um, samples of about 300 per market. So what we're looking for there is not to be able to cut data or anything like that. Really, we're looking for kind of shifts in sentiment uh, so that we can get onto it as quickly as possible. So it's quite light research in terms of how deep we can go, uh, but ideally it was meant to be frequent so that we could look at kind of shifts over time. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, I think one of the things with that is um, the research is, is seems to be kind of always out of date. And even though, you know, we're tracking things fortnightly, even if we were tracking them weekly, I think that this scenario, this situation is still so fluid that data just constantly kind of feels out of date. So I'll take you through what we've got at the moment. Uh, but even when we go into the previous data, we're still looking at the next one to understand what's kind of going on. So uh, one of the, obviously the key, um, lead indicators is going to be consumer confidence you know how do people feel about their kind of financial and, econ and economic kind of futures in good news what we're seeing is this kind of tracking up and i'll show you another slide in a minute which is showing that it's tracking up around the world uh, pretty consistently i think in the us obviously we've seen a significant um, increase in consumer confidence still negative under that 100 line this is an index so it's still negative but going in the right direction Obviously softening recently, I think, because of what's going on in the US market, uh, but positively still kind of going in the right direction and talks of more stimulus as well, which I think is having a big impact um, on US consumer confidence. Obviously in Canada, slightly lower, less positive, and also unfortunately tracking down. And I think what we'll see in a lot of this data is actually um, the Canadian market just softening slightly in lots of kind of metrics. So not significant kind of drops at this stage, but uh, directional in, in the wrong kind of direction. So as we can see, consumer confidence, ideally going in the right direction, but still relatively low. If you look at that across all 16 markets, there are 10 markets which are increasing. And I think it's interesting to look at which are the markets which are increasing and which are increasing most quickly. So obviously the great recovery story from a consumer confidence point of view is China, which has had a significant increase um, over the four dips. I think the other markets that we're seeing increase, the ones that have had uh, an issue with coronavirus and are starting to recover. So um, France, Germany, Italy, these types of markets, which feel like they're coming through the worst of it and are heading back into recovery. Obviously, some of these markets are more positive than others. So China, overall positive. Uh, and then India and Indonesia are also kind of above that line and being positive as well. I think that's got more to do with how they um, respond to surveys than what's going on necessarily from a coronavirus point of view in those markets. But in good news, USA also um, pretty, pretty confident overall compared to lots of other markets in Canada, slightly less so. Um, I think if we start to look at travel intention, um, travel intention is something that we track. We track it over lots of different horizons. I think the one that we kind of look at most in the actual kind of dashboard is the three to six months, only because that's a proxy for uh, what booking timings and booking lag was before coronavirus. And we'll be interested to see how those booking timeframes um, shift as a result of the virus. And we won't know that until we start to see kind of booking has come back. But as you can imagine, travel intention, very, very low. Um, again, kind of tracking, um, you know, um, consistently in the US, but feels like it's slightly coming off in, in the Canadian market as well, uh, which is a bit of a concern. Uh, and also in terms of attitudes to, to next holiday. So we look at kind of different metrics and I think this one's kind of interesting. So obviously most people not thinking about um, their next holiday right now, 55, 58% um, trending slightly down in the US and slightly up in, in Canada. Um, but what we are seeing is a slightly more positive view in the US with relatively more people in that kind of researching stage. And we are seeing probably a slightly more polarizing view in Canada as um, both ends of that kind of spectrum start to shift as well. And I think that's indicative potentially of what we're seeing in lots of other markets, which is this kind of two stream um, return where we have the what we probably call the high value traveler audience, which is very focused and very passionate about travel, being very keen to get out there and people probably less passionate about travel, um, being more cautious or, 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 or more wary about the kind of health or economic kind of situations as well. So I think you know, what we're seeing is there'll be an immediate audience that um, is driving demand in the first instances when borders kind of reopen, and then there'll be a longer tail of more cautious consumers coming after that. 
Um, and I think as well, one of the interesting differences between these two markets is, is intended timing of next trip. And of course, this research doesn't give us the kind of depth to understand why this is so different. Um, but I think, you know, as you can imagine, you know, intent to kind of travel quickly is, is very, very low. Um, and in lots of markets, you see that kind of rise in the six to 12 months or one to two year kind of time frame. And that's obviously what you see in Canada with um, a majority of people looking to travel, you know, in a decent amount of time in the future. Um, differently, in the US market, we're seeing a much bigger you know, proportion of people who are not sure or, or will not travel. So it feels like it's a less certain market with a bit more optimism in Canada, but obviously that's still very, very much um, down the track. And then I think the last thing I'll kind of cover off is, is the situational perceptions of Australia as a safe and secure destination. Obviously, safety and security are hugely important for Australia and a massive driver of Australia as a, a destination of choice. Um, and as some of the guys have mentioned before, Australia's um, performance from a coronavirus point of view has been very, very positive. So I suppose one of the things we want to kind of leverage a bit more in future is that kind of sense of safety as us a, as a destination. Um, and obviously, you know, um, talking about the fact that coronavirus isn't kind of um, transmitted on aircraft, which is great, because I think we've got this perceptive perception issue, which is kind of wrong on both counts, that long haul travel isn't kind of safe. Uh, and I think that Australia is kind of unfairly painted as, as not as being safe as it is, given the kind of um, great uh, situation we've got in Australia. But what we see is, um, you know, the US kind of tracking along 61%, and Canada, again, slightly kind of softening. I'm not sure why that is, but I think this is something that we should kind of continue to kind of look at. If you go to the next slide, um, and we look at perceptions of Australia versus of, of our kind of dealings with coronavirus comparative to other markets, obviously you, Australia, you see Australia on the left there, uh, very, very positive because you've got very, very high levels of information. But um, Canada and the US, which are markets obviously, which we have a huge um, affinity with, uh, are relatively low compared to lots of other markets in their understanding of, of how Australia is kind of dealing with the situation. Really positively, you see a big jump in the USA figures in the last dip, um, but by and large, uh, those two markets kind of trapping, tracking middle of the range. So we'd like to see that increase um, relative to other countries as well. Um, so that's my last slide, I suppose. You know, the things that I've kind of taken out of this are we're seeing Canada slump slightly, and I'd like to dig into a bit more of why that's kind of happening. I'd be really interested to see what happens in the next dip. Um, the US kind of metrics uh, have started to shift, I think, more recently from the kind of trend before um, just or kind of after kind of coronavirus. So we're really interested to see what happens there. Uh, you know, very happily consumer confidence is, is rising uh, from a relatively kind of low base and intent to travel a book is, is very, very low as well. But it feels like we're seeing some kind of green shoots in, in some markets and some, some in the US in particular. Uh, and Australia's safety record, not very well understood at this stage, given how good it is. I'd like to see that improve as well and like to figure out some strategies of, of how we can, how we can drive that a bit more. But that's, that's the last of my slides, if there are any questions, I guess, Chris. That's awesome, Rob. Thank you so much. We uh, really, appreciate, um, really appreciate that update. Um, we do have some time for some questions. Um, I can just see one coming through. Um, let me just have a look. Um, so, uh, Rob, there's a question here just on the research. So the question is based on um, how the attitudes in China have developed during their recovery. Is there anything that can be projected for the US and Canada, which we can prepare for at this stage? Sorry, what was that that can be projected for the US? Yeah, or that we can prepare for for the US and Canada based on some of the trends we're seeing out of China. Yeah, I think China is a really fascinating market to look at. So we've been looking at China very, very closely in terms of particularly how travel came back in that market. So that's um, informed some of the models that we've been looking at in terms of, you know, um, domestic travel and short haul to, to, to kind of long haul travel. So I think really what it shows to me is a how we think markets will come back and what audiences we think will, will come back more quickly and what type of travel they'll be looking for initially. Because obviously what we want to do is drive um, that kind of v shape recovery as much as possible and I think that means that we need to reflect what that 
upcoming consumer behaviour is going to be and drive it at every stage. So that's been the really big learning for me is how we can look at yeah trip type and audience type and and turn them on um, in order. So that's why talking about something like the high value traveller is interesting because they're passionate about travel. So do you do you kind of divide it up into kind of two streams? How do we get that, that drive that immediate kind of um return to travel those people who have been cooped up and are desperate to get out there but then how do we also in the back of our minds keep turning on that more long-term um, less enthusiastic kind of traveler as well um, so i think that's probably been our biggest learning from china well thank you um, another uh, common observation or open for for your thoughts is just around the canadian consumer confidence so i think the reflection here is that Obviously, in Canada, the situation is a bit different there, given that um, there are um, provincial border restrictions uh, like we have in Australia. And obviously, we don't have that in the US. And just a, just a reflection in terms of um, maybe the consumer confidence will return stronger once the domestic travel situation is a bit more free. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure what that was for. I think there's been a slight rise in coronavirus deaths as well recently. And what we what we have seen is those numbers being um, correlate relatively well with obviously the coronavirus kind of situation. So I kind of wondered whether maybe that was having an impact as well. Mm. Yeah, possibly. Um, thank you. And I guess the, probably the other thing just to emphasise, just in case it's not clear to, to our partners, is that this is research that's undertaken and, and uh, conducted by Tourism Australia. We obviously realise there's an abundance of other research sources out there, but this, this research that we're presenting to you guys today is, is stuff that we're undertaking and, uh, and doing ourselves, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're obviously looking at lots of other different data sources. What we wanted to do is have something that would track our 16 markets because quite often um, we, we kind of miss out. So we wanted to keep it consistent and have something that we can kind of rely on. So this is, yeah, this is conducted by Tourism Australia. Yeah, awesome. Well, that's great. Thanks, Rob. Is there any, um, we've probably got a couple of more minutes if there's any other questions from anyone for Rob or even some of the other panelists today for Stephen um, or Andrew. Um, please, uh, please, please pop them in there. I don't think there's anything coming through. Um, so, um, so Rob, again, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, that was a really um, helpful uh, update, hopefully for everyone. Um, and Rob, we um, we will be able to start sharing some of this research with partners if they request it from us. Is that correct? Yes, some of the data we we are sharing with partners, absolutely. Yeah. So post um post the webinar if you guys want to, uh, if any of you want to see uh, any of this data or have access to it yourself, and uh, feel free to reach out to our team and we can coordinate that with uh, with Rob and his team and get some of that to you. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Rob. I'll ask you to you can make yourself invisible again. And um, so we'll probably just we'll probably just wrap it up there. So just in in wrapping up, I just want to um, talk about our next webinar. So our next one's scheduled. Uh, in two weeks, that will be on uh, June thirtieth, uh, two p.m. Pacific time. We're still uh, just working through the agenda for that one, but we are hoping to be joined by uh, Pip Harrison, our uh, managing director. Uh, June thirtieth actually marks the end of our financial year, so we thought it was a good opportunity to maybe uh, talk about some reflections over the past twelve months and and talk a little bit about how we see things unfolding over the next twelve months as we look forward into kind of the next calendar, uh, the next financial year for. Uh, for Tourism Australia. Um, so with that, we'll probably wrap it up there. So thank you for joining us again today. Uh, just a reminder, most of you have probably joined us for past webinars, but uh, you will receive an email from us uh, following up shortly, which will contain uh, a link to uh, complete a very short survey uh, on today's webinar. So we'd appreciate uh, any comments or observations um, or thoughts on today's webinar or uh, thoughts on future uh, topics that you'd like to see us cover. Uh, so with that, we thank you again for joining us today. And uh, lastly, thank you again to all of our speakers uh, that joined us from Sydney, uh, getting up uh, a little bit early to come and uh, talk to us. So we, we very much appreciate that. And uh, we wish you all a great rest of the day. Thanks so much, everyone.